Please be seated. So the chief priests today are in a bit of a predicament. See, in the passages before today's reading, Jesus has just entered the city riding on a donkey to the cheers of the crowd. That might sound familiar from Holy Week, y'all. That's it. He then proceeds to cleanse the temple, cleanse, by overturning the money changers' tables and generally making a mess of things, and finally performs many healings in the temple. Now up to this point, Jesus' teachings have also undermined the power of the priestly families, those that uh, the chief priests were selected from, challenging that this group was more intent on their relationship with Rome than they were with their relationship with God. And so the chief priests, who are responsible for the orderly operation of the temple, approach Jesus in the temple while he teaches in order to challenge his authority. Now, at this point, do you think Jesus could have provided an answer that would satisfy the chief priests? What do you think? Was there a right answer? Or were the chief priests simply looking for an excuse to evict Jesus from the temple? See, the chief priests already know the preferred answer to their questions based on their power structures and the ruling arrangements. The chief priests had already arranged how the law would be taught and followed so that they could keep the peace with the Romans and continue to concentrate power in their families. In other words, we might say that they held a certain set of beliefs about the world based on their trusted authorities, and they only affirmed worship and behavior that fit into their belief system. Jesus wasn't following those rules, and anything that challenges the belief system is dismissed regardless of the evidence to support it because this undermines their worldview and their power structures. Now today, we might call this type of perspective a confirmation bias. And honestly, it's something that we are all subject to. See, biases in general are certain thinking strategies that we humans employ to make life more efficient like stereotypes. They allow us to process information in large chunks very quickly. We see the world according to systems that we either create or are provided for us. And given the information overload in our world today, we use these systems to filter information so that it fits into our belief system. It's our way of uncluttering the world so we can go about our daily lives without being overwhelmed. Now, confirmation bias specifically is our tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with our existing belief. We create stories about the world around us, and when things match our story, great, we feel good. So we focus on those things. When information doesn't match our story, we ignore it or denounce it as false. Examples, confirmation bias seeps into all parts of our lives in simple ways. For example, it can be the basic phrasing of our questions. You've probably heard about this if you took a, a, a statistics class ever and had to do surveys. But even for us, every day, it can be as simple as if you are to search for, are cats better than dogs, guess what answer you're going to get? Cats are articles about cats being better than dogs. The bias is built in. 
If you then reverse the search, you might be surprised to find that there are articles that suggest that dogs are better than cats, too. <laughs> Unfortunately, in our modern world, confirmation bias has become monetized, like everything else. Companies exploit our biases to keep us interested. Okay, social media is the primary example of this phenomenon. Sites like Facebook, You've heard of the famous Facebook algorithm? Well, that algorithm feeds you information that fits your bias so that you feel good and you feel like you're in a comfortable space. As a result, if this is our primary place of getting information, we are often not pushed to challenge our belief systems. And even when we search with Google, it will favor returning results based on where you've previously browsed, because believe me, they know everything. And so our search results are tailored to our biases. We see this in other places, like news outlets as well, because news organizations are operated by humans. They naturally have biases. The bias of various news companies has been fairly well documented in the last decade. And that's OK. But if we only follow one or two news sources, we will most likely find that they are presenting a bias that is comfortable for us. Now, challenging our confirmation bias requires being intentional, acting with Humility, as Paul might put it. We have to be aware and open-minded. First, we must be willing to acknowledge our biases. I have news for you. We all have biases. That is just part of human nature. Then we must be willing to research and explore information that challenges our beliefs. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you've never done this, it's probably going to make you kind of uncomfortable. Confirmation bias is all about finding information that keeps us in our comfort zone. It gets more complicated when we're addressing biases that involve other people. In some cases, when we face a person who disagrees with us, we tend to dismiss them or demonize them as a group. Those people don't believe what I believe. In other cases, we might delegitimize other people. I'm not even going to bother arguing with that person. More alarming, political activists of all flavors exploit our confirmation bias to drive polarization in our society. Wedges are driven between us and them that emphasize the extremes of belief, and they are fed by information tailored to our biases. So how do we counter this insidious pattern? Well, psychologists and sociologists tell us the best way to challenge our biases about other people is to have a conversation with them and to develop a relationship. Hmm. Now, believe it or not, I'm going to dive into deeper waters. And this might make us all uncomfortable. In 2012, a firestorm erupted around Chick-fil-A when the company's CEO, Dan Cathy, made a series of public comments opposing same-sex marriage. Reports also showed that the company's charitable arm donated millions of dollars to organizations seen by LGBTQ activists as hostile to LGBTQ rights. Activists called for protests and boycotts, while supporters of the restaurant chain and opponents of same-sex marriage ate there in support of the restaurant. Now, based on your beliefs, you are probably thinking one thing or another about this situation right now. You may even remember 
how you felt when this happened. This may influence your opinions and your descriptions of Dan Cathy or of gay rights activists. I invite you to take a moment to simply notice or remember your reaction. About six months later, in January of 2013, gay rights activist and executive director of Campus Pride, Shane Windmeyer, published an article in Huffington Post that began this way. After months of personal phone calls, text messages, and in-person meetings, I am coming out in a new way as a friend of Chick-fil-A's president and CEO, Dan Cathy. And I'm kind of nervous about it. I have come to know him and Chick-fil-A in ways that I would not have thought possible when I first started hearing from LGBTQ students about their concerns over the chicken chain's giving practices. Winmeyer goes on to explain that Kathy reached out to him almost immediately after the firestorm, requesting a dialogue to learn more about the concerns of the LGBTQ community. He, there were unintended consequences from his remarks, and he was very concerned about what was happening. Although the initial conversations were awkward, they both committed to giving this dialogue a fair chance. Winmeyer continues, it is not often that people with deeply held and completely opposing viewpoints actually risk sitting down and listening to one another. We see this failure to listen and learn in our government, in our communities, and even in our families. Dan, Kathy, and I would, together, try to do better than each of us had experienced before. Windmeyer, for his part, came to understand that the Chick-fil-A brand was being used by both sides of the political debate in order to drive a deeper division and polarization by intentionally fueling feelings of hate on all sides. Through these conversations, both Kathy and Winmeyer challenged their assumptions about people they disagree with. They faced their biases and the limitations of their beliefs in order to respect and better understand another human being. Winmeyer concludes, Dan, in his heart, is driven by his desire to minister to others and had to choose to continue our relationship throughout this controversy. He had to both hold to his beliefs and welcome me into them. He had to face the issue of respecting my viewpoints and life, even while not being able to reconcile them with his belief system. He defined this to me as the blessing of growth. He expanded his world without abandoning it, and so did I. Were minds changed? We may not yet know the full extent of the work being done. In 2019, it was reported that Chick-fil-A was no longer financially supporting anti-LGBTQ organizations though Dan Cathy has been reported by some as personally continuing to support such organizations. Rather ironically, it's really unclear whether or not this is true because searching the subject brings up a series of results that are all intentionally biased in one direction or another. If I ask the question one way, I will find one answer. If I ask the question another way, I get another answer. And I could not find an in-between article about it. My goal is not to argue for or against the choices of Chick-fil-A and Dan Cathy. 
we must all act according to our own convictions. I am curious about when we find ourselves acting and judging according to our pre-existing biases. And did we choose to follow the way of love modeled in Jesus? The chief priests were not actually interested in engaging in dialogue with Jesus. They simply hoped to undermine his arguments and send him away as quickly as possible. They had no intention of being drawn into an uncomfortable conversation. They were in the habit of being in charge, and they were confident that they were right. They're not hoping to find that God is working in new ways in the world. I do believe that God works in unexpected ways. Jesus teaches us that God is at work in the world every day. But often we must challenge our assumptions and expectations about how that work is being accomplished. Sometimes we have to get uncomfortable, y'all. Sometimes we might be called to hang out with somebody we've judged in the past. But notice that for Jesus, the great hope was that tax collectors and prostitutes are repenting. That's right. The ones that had been judged as sinners in the community. And what does he say? He promises second chances for redemption for them. Though we may find safety and comfort in our own biases, Jesus challenges us to expand and grow. And y'all, in a world that becomes further polarized every single day, I want you to know that we are invited to become a community of better understanding where we choose to cut across our biases to seek and serve Christ in all our neighbors.